Releasing the full power of the creative economy demands collaboration. This is what John Hawkins, global strategist and author, will be discussing in greater detail on our next session titled Creativity, the First Asset. Please welcome him to the stage. Thank you, and I want to thank the organizers for inviting me here to this amazing event. So amazing that I've had to change my mind about what I was going to say several times today. But I want to make um, three propositions that are the result partly of what I've been thinking over the last few years, but partly what I've heard over the last two days here. The first is that creativity is the co-founder of humanity. I wanted to say we were the founder, it sounded better, but um, we have, of course, our bodies. We are embodied creatures, and that's always been important, and it's particularly important as we start to co-work with AI devices that are not embodied, and therefore cannot share feelings. They can express emotion, they know the words, they cannot feel the emotion. The second is that the creative economy is the first economy to be based on people, on people's imaginations, their ideas, and their ability to package and price and trade those ideas. And the winner in that game is the person who can change perception. Um, and the third proposition is that there is literally no limit to the ability of an individual to change the perception of another individual, to change that individual's perceptions. Um, one thing I've been doing over the last few years is to try and work out where it all began. And I, I, the creative economy as a concept is, is very new, and obviously creativity and innovation and, and, and ideas and art, culture started way before that. So, I had to go further back, and I went right back to the beginnings. Um, this, is, this is a very famous, this is one of the first early cave paintings 35,000 years ago um, in France. More recently, there have been discoveries in Southeast Asia. There will be more discoveries in Asia, there will be more discoveries in Africa. Um, and I began to trace it through, and I realized that as I, as I was working out the development of the history of, the history of creativity, that culture, creativity, innovation, and civilization was sort of, they were all bound up together, that they march hand in hand. You, you, the very strong correlation between culture and creativity, innovation, civilization, and there's a very strong causal relationship. They, if you have one, you're likely to have the others. They work together. And at some point, this is a moment that I am fascinated by. Um, this was an act of pure imagination, the person who drew the first straight line. There are no straight lines in nature. You cannot see a straight line in nature. Uh, up to this moment, everything had been representational of what was out there. And then this was the first example of conceptual art. The first example of something purely imagined by someone and possibly drawn in the sand and then maybe covered over because it was embarrassing. Maybe not, I don't know, we don't know. The history of the straight line was fascinating. And it led to, it led to um, the, alpha, the alphabets depend on straight lines, it led to geometry, you can't have geometry without straight lines. You can't do engineering without straight lines. And I like this picture of houses. Um, Northern China, um, I love it because it's, it's, a, it's a house, uh, architecture and engineering built, not in a cave, but on the edge of a cave. Um, and the Industrial Revolution, and then something very dramatic happened in the at the end of the last century, when creativity 
which had been always there, but marginal, special, a bit weird, um, often as much, often a troublemaker, shocking, um, began to move center stage. And this photograph was taken in Soho in the center of London um, around this time. Let's, let's, let's celebrate creativity, let's fill this town with artists. An idea that would have been hor horrific to the ancient Greeks. Plato, Aristotle thought that artists were, well, he knew they were troublemakers. Um, and this was the growth of the recognition that humanity needs creativity, not only for well-being, but in order to develop, and that although each activity in sectors may be quite small and very specialized, if you put them all together, you add up to a significant amount of the economy, um, a rapidly growing amount of the economy, and an economy that, or a way of life, not just a way of work, but a way of life that young people, many young people want to do, particularly those coming out of the universities. There's a, there's a divide, which is, uh, we talked a bit about equality and inequality. Um, people often talk about the creative economy as bringing joy and happiness and, 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 and equality. Well, actually, yes, but it can bring also um, loneliness and despair, and it can be a cause of inequality. Both, both those things are happening. This is the creative economy today um, because my latest book is on invisible work, it's cognitive work, it's insight, it's very private, very personal, very subjective, and you can do it anywhere. This is an airport lounge, it's a historic photograph, no one's wearing a mask, taken three years ago. Um, one of these people is a very famous architect, another is a very famous choreographer, but you don't know. You don't know who they are. You don't know if they're working or not. Um, they're just there. And this is a measure of the widespread, if you like, the infiltration of creativity into the, the whole of life. Not quite the whole of life, but large sectors of life. And I think today, this creativity that has been around for such and such a long time is now center stage. Today, it has more opportunity to change the future of humanity than ever before. This world is being co-founder. Um, the two co-founders, the body, the, the spirit, the soul, the imagination, the creativity, the innovation. And the body was dominant, now the brain is dominant, the imagination is dominant, and it has more opportunity to change our future. Our, our co-founder has more opportunity to change our future than ever before. The second proposition I want to make is that the, the creative economy is the first economy based on people. Um, and John Newbegin and others call it the first human economy, which I think is absolutely correct. Um, when I went to university and studied economics, um, the economics profession was from, from, from Mill to Marx to um, Alfred Marshall, who was the, the, the inventor of the sort of classical consensus about 100 years ago, which we still studied at university. Um, John Maynard Keynes, um, up to today's central bankers. It's all about land and labor and capital. Um, and they're wrong. It's, they, we need those occasionally. We could not have this physical event without land. But it's not, the value of the land is not what makes this a success. So we need a bit of land, a bit of labor, a bit of capital, but it's not the prime asset. The prime asset is the, is the imagination. Um, and that's a, that's a significant change. I think one of, the, one of the problems we face in trying to understand the creative economy is um, the economics profession. 
I'm waging a war against the economics profession. I apologize if there are any economists here, we can have a conversation afterwards. I, I think they have failed to grasp this change. And that is not just a professional crisis for the economists, but it's, professional, it's, it's, a, it's a responsibility crisis for governments that depend very largely on economists to provide justification for their policy. What is possible? Um, I saw this first in... I think it's an obstacle to understanding what is possible. Um, I saw this first in uh, Tehran, which has a very lively startup. Most important asset. I'm brought, uh, I think, again and again of how this manifests itself in very, very, very young people. Um, the Harbour School for the Study of Children has done for 20, 30 years research into how children develop. And every child is born with the raw material to be creative. And every child, we don't quite know why, has an instinct to use their imagination, to draw on the wall, to draw on any bits of paper, to draw on their parents' faces. They love stories. They love dressing up. They love dressing up. They love being somebody. They have imaginary friends that are often more significant to them than their real friends. Um, peak creativity for all of us is about age three or four. After that, sorry to say, it, it's that, that raw creativity gets a bit weaker. And the reason is, of course, we go to school. But, and we go to school for very good reason, to be socialized, to meet other people, to learn stuff. But in order to do that, we have to sit in rows, be like other people, and stop being quite so strongly and vividly and passionately individual. And for many people, they then think that creativity is something they might be punished for, um, not part of the school curriculum, really. And anyway, it's expressing themselves, and they may not want to express themselves. They want to fit in. So there we are. It's a problem. Everybody knows it's a problem. We don't quite know what to do about it. Um, I also think creativity needs freedom, and the freedom is a very private, it's bigger than free speech or freedom of press, it's a very private freedom to manage your relationship in your head towards ideas, to say yes, no, maybe, perhaps, um, change your mind without telling anybody, change your mind back again without telling anybody. Um, we need that, if you like, it's not an intellectual, it's a sort of cognitive freedom, it's a cognitive freedom. We need that cognitive freedom and we need to mix with people to come buddies with people who enjoy that. We don't need to agree with them, but we need to be with people who are similarly enjoying that cognitive freedom. I become very interested in why people are creative. Why do we do this? Why do we want to live this way, work this way, mix with people who live and work this way? Um, and I, I think, again, this is part of my war against economists. <laughs> I think in a way that anthropologists, sociologists, um, psychologists have a huge contribution to make to our understanding of creativity that is simply not being picked up by the dominant professional contribution of economists. Um, the psychology, why do we do it? I, I, I've written a bit about this recently, and I think a large part of it is our wish to do something that is it, it, I'm going to make a grand statement here. It makes the world a better place. The artist who is doing something for their own pleasure still thinks, and rightly so, that, that, that the result of what they're doing is, is good, is beneficial. And it's not in a transactional way, it's in a transformative way. It, it is transformative. And if you say that, of course, they will deny it. It's embarrassing. 
but as well as creating something beautiful, they, they think that act of creating something beautiful is beneficial and good. And that is what drives a lot of people on. Whatever, whatever it is, I use the example of painting, but it could be, it could be an elegant line of software code. Um, it could be a, a beautiful way of arranging space in a building. The, the, it's not just a transaction between the client and the creative person, it's transformative of the client. They see the world in a different way. Um, part of this is what I call the four, four circles of work. Um, the first two are based on Bertrand Russell. The second two are my own more recent editions. And the, the fourth circle, the highest circle, the most rarefied circle is changing a perception of a perception. This is what the great creative people do. My, my examples here are mainly designers. Um, Mark Newsom, I think, is one of them. Virgil Abloh, uh, who I really wanted to be here, and I'm very, well, we're all very saddened by his death. Um, Johnny Ive, of course. Um, these people have the ability to move sector by sector and in each sector to 